Hello everyone. I am Ved, and today we'll be talking about best coding practices. So uh, this will primarily, like, this will exclusively be from the three links which were shared with the team uh, regarding what regarding the coding practices to be followed. And the reason I've stuck with those is just so that all of us have a common point of reference. Uh, obviously, for anyone uh, in the community watching this, uh, we would probably link those. Uh, docs of like link those pages there as well. So yeah, we can make a start. So in the three pages I, which were shared, I've kind of tried to classify this in these categories, just so that uh, we can have a better division of the whole structure. Uh, so yeah, so obviously it's kind of obvious. The general ones are just to avoid code duplication, keeping things simple, and to kind of be able to easily separate different uh, parts of your code. Uh, obviously, I've tried to go through some examples from the, like from IV in the front ends and testing uh, on purpose, because most of us deal with that, uh, whether you're reviewing PRs or whether you're writing code yourself. So uh, regarding duplication, there's two examples I personally feel like emphasizing on when it comes to avoiding duplication. Uh, the first one is regarding partial mixed functions. As many of you know what that is, is if there's a particular function which has a number of backends which are supported, but do you have to implement a superset of the functionality. And out of that superset, every backend supports a certain set out of the out of it natively. So when for that particular subset of problems which that backend solves, you want to na use that native implementation, but you also want a way to cover the rest of the superset for all of the backends. Uh, so for example, one, one example is interpolate. So in interpolate, uh, there's different modes in which you can interpolate. So for example, the TF area mode and the bicubic TensorFlow mode, these are TensorFlow specific modes. So these will only be supported in TensorFlow. And that is a given that you will need to have a compositional implementation of some kind in JAX and, and in Torch. Now, one way to do it is to just use the native framework functions and do the compositional implementation in the backend itself. What that would result in is code duplication, because you're doing the same logic. And the only difference is you're using different frameworks functions, which are relative equivalence. Now, the solution in this case is just to avoid duplication. You take that code, which is common, and you implement it in a compositional implementation, which uses IV, rather, so that you don't have to repeat that code across JAX and Torch for the modes which you know that are not natively supported in JAX and Torch. So you know that you are not going to gain anything uh, as such in terms of efficiency. If that function, if that mode was natively present, you, then you would gain efficiency. But uh, if that mode does not exist, you will not gain efficiency by doing compositional native backend implementations. So you just make a, comp a compositional IV implementation, which both of those would use. And this is one way in which we try to avoid code duplication in IV. The other example is from Gradients, uh, but I'm not uh, blowing my own trumpet. Uh, but basically, in the Gradients functions, uh, this is another case where you can avoid code duplication, where you, when you know that a certain uh, kind of functionality has to be there in all the backends. And this is not a superset case, per se, because here you know that the native backends already support that functionality completely. You just need to have certain pre-processing and post-processing steps in all of your backends. Then even in that case, you can just have certain helpers in IV which would be used in all of those backends. So this is the way in which you'll import it in all of those backends, so that, again, you don't uh, repeat that same piece of code, making things easier to debug, update, whatever. Um, so the next thing is quick, I was yeah. going to say a quick question, but yes, sir. Maybe it has the same one. Go, go ahead, yes, sir. Um, yeah, so you, you've said that, for example, in interpolate, if the native yeah. uh, framework doesn't support specific mode, it's better to write it as an IV compositional function because um, you wouldn't be getting any kind of efficiency uh, benefits yeah. if, if not supported. So I guess the assumption yeah. is we're using the compiled IV code because obviously exactly. there's also overhead. 
So, yeah, exactly. Because I think the benchmark which we are assuming, probably Dan could correct her, but I think the benchmark which we are assuming is the compiler is necessary to use IV as of now. So the re uh, reference against which we'll compare it will be the compiled compositional implementation, IV implementation against the compiled neat, uh, implementation in which the backend uh, used native framework functions for the same logic. Yeah. The, the only reason anybody should really do anything eagerly is for kind of debugging purposes and stepping through the code and stuff, right? Even like with Torch, now you should be using compile when you're training. And if you're deploying, yeah. you shouldn't even be using Torch, you should be exporting to Onyx or something anyway. But um, yeah, so, so exactly. Um, and, and even the Cython wrapping stuff really, it makes IV fast eagerly, but even that's really only to make kind of debugging models and stuff a bit more yeah. painless and stuff. So yeah. Um, yeah. Quick, quick question on that as well then um, is, yeah. So, so just to get my head around this, this partial mix. So obviously just like going back a bit, we originally had these very simple versions. A function is either primary, where it was basically just a placeholder for like lots of different primary functions, or it was totally compositional, where there was no primary function, it was in, and it was all one single IV composition implementation. And then we have yep. mixed, which didn't really have this concept of partial. It was pretty much a function that was both compositional and had some primary backends. And it was kind of the whole function though. There was no like subcomponents yeah. of it. But but now we're obviously having something that's much more flexible, which is well actually sometimes we need framework specific logic. Like fully compositional wouldn't be good, but fully primary or, or like only having it just mixed in a conventional sense where some backends yeah. have the entire thing and all of it's implemented in the primary thing would be overkill. So just to understand then what like in the case of in, in, interplay, this exact case, what do we yep. see when we look at the, because I've actually not checked the source code, I guess I should do that right now, but what do we see when we look at the IB implementation in general? Do we see kind of what is a compositional implement, implementation with some, and all these helper functions, when you say here, these kind of, these partial modes, let's say that the y cube TensorFlow mode, yep. we now implement that as a composition. Um, yep. Yeah, maybe just, just explain a little bit about kind of yep. where, just what the structure looks like. Yeah, sure. So uh, as you know, this partial mixed handler would be uh, set for every backend independently. So this would decide whether you defer to the compositional implementation or the primary implementation based on whatever the argument set. Yeah. So uh, yeah. for example, talking about TF, 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 PyCubic TensorFlow mode, uh, in yeah. the TensorFlow backend implementation, you would just use the native TensorFlow function by passing that as the mode, and that would uh, be okay. sufficient. Whereas in the compositional implementation, you'd implement everything. You'd implement how PyCubic uh interpolation is done you would just implement it using iv functions altogether yeah uh, and, 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 and the partial mix handle here literally yeah. just turns a boolean doesn't it so basically yeah exactly it basically just says like should we use and basically then so if mode is not in here um yeah. so so just in this exact case then like would this partial mixed handler have different lists that you check for the mode being in for each backend that's set? Would each mode, each backend have a different list here in the implementation or something? Yep, exactly. So any backend can have its own condition for whatever way they want to defer yeah. to the composition of the primary one. So Got it. But each, each case, of these yeah. modes has a compositional implementation. So in a way you can think of like each mode yeah. has a composition exactly. implementation, but some of the backends like don't yeah. use it because there's literally like direct C++ code that exactly. that. Exactly. And, and even if the same thing exists in the backends as well as in the composition implementation for the backends to support that mode, there's no code duplication yeah. because the backends are using the native one and uh, the yeah. native implementation itself, whereas we are using uh, the compositional one for the rest of the backends. Yeah. Do, do we have a, a clear explanation in the deep dive yes. about this new concept of partial mix? Yes, uh, it's in the function we types do. page. Uh, inside mix functions, you have a subsection for partial mix with an example of okay. interpolate itself. And I think there's uh, also, no, I think the example is for linear because a linear is a relatively simpler function to understand. So yeah. we kind of focus on yeah, linear, yeah. wherein torch, I think that- And, and linear is also partial mix. Lin I, yeah. I thought linear might be so simple that it's just mixed, but it's even partial uh, mixed. Yeah. Linear. Actually, I think I think it's something to do with torch uh, supporting or not supporting three dimensional inputs or something like that. Yeah, yeah. And as a result, for if it's three dimensional, you use the compositional. Yeah. Because as you remember earlier, we used to completely have a compositional implementation, but then when yeah. we saw yeah. the torch has a linear function, we tried to use yeah. that. Uh, in the to, to be honest, as we become increasingly performance minded, and as we get this dashboard where we look at the self translation performance and all this kind of stuff. It's actually going to become increasingly important for us to do partial mixed implementations, I think, because yeah. when you really want to push the performance, you want to be using as many 
kernels as you yeah. can in the back end. And sometimes that means that you just need to like find a way to weave that into the implementation yeah. somehow. Yeah. In fact, when we started to support partial mix implementations, if you see through the API right now, a lot of functions are partial mix already. Many functions yeah. have been kind of changed because we try, we are trying to push yeah. the limits of how much we can make use of the native implementations and not cause yeah, overhead yeah. when you're using the same backend against yeah. the same front end. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and that's exactly what we should we should be doing. It makes the code a bit more complex, but obviously performance is key. Um, yeah, yeah. So, 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 so of course, uh, in a way, like the benefit is if we have these like the performance backends and then like the version changes of the framework and like actually no longer this kernel is there or something we always have the we always have we often have a compositional implementation to fall back to so like even the new version yep. we can keep supporting the function and getting the test passing and stuff like yes that. and in, in fact in terms of flexibility if the new version comes in and it supports the mitchell cubic mode for example yeah. the new version yeah. version specific implementation would have a lambda function which would yeah. not have this particular element yeah. and the rest of the ones yeah. the composition one yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah, um, yeah makes sense. Yeah. Um, cool. I'll stop. So, that. Yeah. So I think this is something which, again, many it's kind of obvious again, wherein you might see these two functions in IV, wherein the implementation really is just very simple. Like IV exists, just use X is not none. But if you think about it from a code clean, how uh, the cleanliness of the code or the code clarity standpoint. You can think of all the occurrences in the framework where you or the front ends where you're using IV dot exists and try to imagine all of these occurrences instead being X is not none. And the difference in how good I, using IV exists uh, looks in terms of the code uh, and how clear it uh, the I, how clearly it specifies the idea of what is being done rather than just having X is not none all through the code base. That is something which again, you, but just having a simple implementation for even if it's a very simple functionality and you think that can be reused in multiple places, just feel free to add a function to IV which would have that simple, uh, obvious functionality and we can make use of that. Uh, we can discuss that later. Uh, but uh, just feel free to add anything which you feel is uh, being used multiple times and that could make the code much more uh, elegant if you are looking at, uh, looking at it later. Uh, similar thing with IV, is IV container? I think you'll see the same thing with the with is native array, is IV array, and so on, uh, wherein some of those are just doing an is instance check. I'm not talking about is native array, sorry, because is native array has backend specific implementations. But if you're just doing is instance IV array, you can think of all of the instances where you're do, uh, where you're do, where you are using is IV array and imagine just having is instance checks all over the place, and uh, how elegant it would look to use is IV array instead. So that is something which I felt could be an example uh, of keeping things simple. And uh, yeah, well, I think I think this one is a bit subjective. I, I think when I think about the exist implementation, I think there's a few more parts to it where oh no, the default value is one where kind of yes. you can kind of then use it exists and then return the default and you can have a lambda and stuff. And I, I exactly. think I think this I can see how this is subjective and maybe these two examples don't fully fully illustrate the point. Like, because because sometimes obviously with the is IV array or or, or or it's particularly is native array. Sometimes you need to check for a list of is instances. Like in Jax, for example, there's like five or six different objects that kind of can represent a native array and stuff. Uh, so I, then you kind of start thinking, well, if there is a function is native array, there's probably one that says is IV array. And again, like I remember when I was writing the code, and if you have loads of instance checks all in like several lines, it just just kind of adds more. Yeah, to just kind of a little bit more um, to follow when you read it. And I think the readability of the final code is improved when you have kind of very simple functions like this. Yeah. Um, of course, in a way, it also obscures it a little bit because then when you look at the source file, you can't know for sure what's going on because exists might not be, is not none. You need to quickly step inside it and open up a new file to declare. Um, so it makes it less kind of self-contained per source file. It, it is subjective, I think, I think um, but I think going for this approach more often than not makes the code more readable and and, and is 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 useful. Um, yeah. But I, I do understand the subjectivity, but I guess we should try yeah. to be consistent. And, and I mean of course one one extreme is you add this you add it for something which is even more stupid, but uh, at least yeah. a, but yeah, to yeah. Some, some extent of course we, we should not put it that uh, to that extreme, but uh, at least then whenever you see that something uh, in terms of the how elegant the code is if kind of makes a huge difference, then we can possibly consider um, adding that.
uh, function. Yeah, I guess it kind of depends how often it comes as well. I guess it become it depends on how often it's used. If it's used all the yeah. time, and like we can remove the lines of code, then it's, it's helpful. I think in these kind of cases. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, it it also comes down to taste, but I think for uh, yeah, for this example, just uh, well, take, take draw, 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 draw. yeah, drawing the line is a hard line to draw, and maybe this is kind of maybe this is the boundary in a way, like things that get way kind of simpler than this. Maybe we don't interfract, and this is kind of yes. close to the boundary of where it can be used for the whole thing. Yeah. Yeah, cool. Let's probably move forward. So, I mean, separation of concerns. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think it would be important. So I, 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 think, I think we have a util function, right? I, I think that the, the cheat sheet is basically the util function, unless they're not in the correct location. But a lot of these is instant checks and stuff should probably be in one place because they're. There's a whole page yeah. on actually the utility functions that aren't kind of array processing. They're more just kind of checks or something. Maybe we should move them there if they're not already there. Yeah, actually, all of them have accumulated in general because you tend to add whatever right. is not in any of the other submodules to general. But probably we should have yeah. a way to kind of move them uh, to. There is, a, there is a utility function, isn't there? There's a like we just about. I've forgotten what's in there now. Well, yeah. There was at one point. I all and any, all and any are present in the utility subordinate. Probably the is probably the probably the is instance stuff should be moved to utils. I think it feels a bit more like. Yeah. But I'll leave these decisions with you anyway. Yeah. But um. <laughs> separation of concerns uh, is basically at the crux of the whole structure with isolated frontends and backends. But uh, to highlight a few points in that regard, uh, one of the examples which uh, came, one of the examples which uh, were thought of was wherein you kind of have different helpers which can be used in multiple backends. Uh, so in, if you define a particular helper, like for example, two TF padding or check parallel pad, for example, this was present in the parallel backend, the helper. Now you should. It it is very tempting to kind of import the helper directly from the paddle backend into the TensorFlow backend, but the problem it results in is that now whenever you import the TensorFlow backend or you set the backend to TensorFlow, the paddle backend is also imported, which means to use the TensorFlow backend you need to have paddle installed, which means uh, which is why ideally you should be trying to kind of uh, not import one backend inside other backend because this is kind of the uh, the crux in the whole structure of Ivy, wherein you only need to install the backends and frontends which you are transpiling to, and not the rest. So, uh, so in such cases, if you have if you have a helper already in one of the backends, and you are adding a function, uh, you're updating a function, you re realize that this helper should be used in that that backend, rather than importing it directly from there, you should actually move that helper to and to the corresponding IV file and import from both of those places to uh, those backends to avoid adding that dependency. The second case isn't exactly separation of concerns, but uh, just I thought of highlighting that as well, because that's the only place in which in a single IB file we are importing frameworks, uh, because we need to, uh, where uh, in the converters, for example, if you want to convert from a Haiku module to an IB module, the goal is just to wrap the Haiku module inside an IB module. Before that, you need to be able to import Haiku. Now, one way to do it would be to import at the top of the file, which would result in requiring you to have Haiku installed to even import IV because I'm importing IV, import stateful, which imports more converters. And so in this case, this is like this is not separation of concerns again, but I just wanted to highlight this as a special case where this is the only place I think where we are importing frameworks in an IV file, uh, if I'm not wrong. Uh, and the reason we are doing that is because that's the we there's no other way to kind of expose it in an IV file for someone to access it uh, other, otherwise. So basically, just wanted to point that out. Um, I also probably should say that maybe now they should be focusing on flax more. I think haikus now actually yeah they've they kind of they've, they've, they've themselves the said flax. That, yeah they, in the readme itself they're saying we recommend people to use flax so yeah. Probably yeah, yeah. Should. maybe we should put a bit more emphasis on flax in our demos, maybe. <laughs> yeah, um, I should have put the flax. Another quick question. Example, yeah. yeah. Another quick point is, um, do we not have any like local imports in our efficient sub backends, is what we may have called them, like the Xformers implementation that Yasser did? Do we not have any local imports there or, or not? Maybe Yasser can comment. Um, maybe Yasser's. Yeah. What, what do you mean by local imports? Like yeah. Well, like this. 
like this, like like where we 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 have and we're importing Haiku in the bottom right example. I wasn't sure where the sub backends whether we keep the no. the dependencies contained. No, we don't. Or they just an optional or something, and then we say if you, it's not installed, yeah. please install it. Probably yeah, so it should go. Well, I guess maybe. Well, I guess the question is then, like maybe they should be consistent. Like I'm not sure exactly because it seems like we could just say in this case, like oh, you're trying to do from Haiku. Haiku's not in. Oh no, but it's about importing. I feel as though exactly. we should probably just implicitly import Xformers in this Xformer sub backend. We probably do the same. Yep, exactly. So uh, no, I think in in case of Xformers, the reason we have kind of tried to organize it in the other way is like we've tried to just replicate the same structure of backends into sub backends. So we are dealing with that, trying to make it consistent in that way, where you have a sub backends folder inside a torch backend which has a layers file, which has that uh, yeah. Xformer import. So that whenever you set the sub backend to Xformers, that is the only play, uh, case where that frame implementation will be used. I, I guess my point is probably what would be good is if like somebody is using Ivy and they just so happen to have Torch and Xformers installed, and it's an old version of Torch that hasn't merged it anyway. We should probably default to Xformers. Like maybe we shouldn't yeah. expect them to set the backend. I mean, we we could do that. We we could do that if we want to. Like we can just uh, see if the uh, library was installed. We can do an import lib check to yeah. do that. But in terms of folder structure, yeah, I, mean, I could I would think that it would be better to have it different. in a different folder. Yes. Yeah, I see what you mean. Sorry, it's a bit of a sidetrack. It just made me think of it with the haiku stuff. But yeah. I think I think if you're using an old version of Torch and it's X format is on your machine, exactly. then it should use it by default. Yeah. I mean, standard. like because if we go by the direction of like for example, like X format just has one or two functions dealing with attention. But if you're talking about Torch yeah. vision, for example, which we are also discussing about recently. Uh, like we yeah. can have a torch vision sub backend that could potentially have more functions well, as well. Uh, whereas that, that's the same. The if torch vision, if, if torch vision is installed already, then probably we yeah. should be using it by default. Yeah, yeah, and maybe even if it's not, we should give a warning by default. We should say, like, by the way, yeah. set the torch backend. You're using a function that actually could be running faster yeah. if you just did if install this. All of this should yeah. happen. I think there's, anyway, a so there's, a there's a there's a task for that already. Uh, yeah. Okay. So, Good stuff. Uh, yeah. So. Uh, like the only only point I had is like rather than having the local imports in all of the torch backend files, we'd rather have it in the sub backend folder to keep things more organized. Given that the possibility that there's more sub backends uh, like that. Um, yeah, let's probably move forward. Uh, I mean, this is even more obvious than what we've discussed before. But uh, basically, now we're talking a bit about variables. Uh, obviously, it's we the six points. I mean, you can see it already. But uh, we can go through some of those examples. Uh, meaningful and descriptive names. So this is kind of a general policy. Like the more complex your implementation gets, the more descriptive your variable names should be, because uh, we could potentially have people from the community wanting to add uh, anything they want and update anything in the framework or the front end or testing or whatever. And they, it, we should make it as easy as possible for them to understand what this is. Obviously, this also has a limit. Like we shouldn't uh, add unnecessary information in the function name, but your function name should tell uh, the person reading the code exactly what you're trying to do uh, in the function. So uh, yeah, that is the first uh, point. Uh, consistent vocabulary. Uh, now, from these three examples, you know what I'm referring to. Uh, for example, with access. There's an alternative name for access which could be used, which is dims. And you might see a lot of torch functions which use dims. Now, we should stick to one of those two all through the code base. Uh, like, if, it, if it's the front end, then obviously we need to follow whatever the front end does. But in Ivy, we should stick to uh, that one name, and oh, that's it. Like, just so that we do not introduce any kind of ambiguity about there being a difference between what dim stands for and what access stands for. Same thing with shape. A torch has size, TensorFlow has tensor shape. And we want to kind of ensure that we have one particular name which is consistent across uh, all the files which we have. Uh, the third thing is ret. Obviously, one, one way to confuse ret is to use out, which I've seen in a few parts of the framework as well. But the reason it should not be done is because out can easily be confused with the out argument. So. I like given that I've seen some examples. I didn't want to put those examples here on purpose, but uh, because like I wanted to focus primarily on what we should do uh, rather than what we should not do. Uh, but uh, as, as a result of that, we should kind of use ret instead of out. And you can find more examples about this. I've just tried to put three of them, which uh, which I think are the most common uh, in the framework. Uh, 
no magic numbers. I think this is again something which is very important because uh, if I am writing a backend implementation and somewhere I just add uh, like 3.14 something uh, and the whole number, and I just use that number directly in the backend implementation, someone reading the code, obviously people who know anything about math know that know that know what that number stands for but anyone re any num it could be any other number and if we um yeah, yeah, yeah i have covered that in the later sections as well yeah uh, i have i have also seen such examples and again i didn't want to put in the bad examples on purpose to kind of focus on what's supposed to be done uh, but uh, yeah very kind of you <laughs> yeah so uh, Basically, what magic numbers, uh, as I mentioned, is like it could have any kind of number, uh, which tan hyperbolic of 75 or something like that, which no one would understand what that number stands for if you just use that number directly. So you should use an exact, you should store it in a variable, you should store it as a constant in IV or wherever uh, need be. And you should indicate exactly what that number does, because someone who should, who's reading the code should be able to know what that number stands for and why that number is used. Um, obviously, I think there should all be in a constants file, right? Because there is a, there is a constant yep. file. Also, as part of the standard, probably this everything the should be in a singular. Yeah. But I'm saying, so if you said that you should store it there or wherever it needs to be, like yep. it should always be in the constant file. I think, right? Uh, actually, like for example, there's a different. Uh, there's one case which I have come across is like uh, I think it's with uh, the Tanich uh, activations implementation wherein there's some sort of a mathematical formula which is being used. Now, it is so specific right. to that one function that it yeah. would not make a lot of use yeah, yeah. to have it in constants. So in that case, yeah. you just kind of uh, write in some names the files, those, uh, Gellu, Gellu, yeah, it's, it's in Gellu. So to have okay. that implementation, to have that in constants would not make a lot of sense. It would just clutter the whole thing. So just make it specific yeah, yeah. to Gellu. And, Obviously, given that it's a mathematical formula, we've also linked the issue where it was defined because yeah, it's yeah. being currently fixed. And it's, by just, it's just defined as a global constant. And then when you refer to it in the file, you're not doing IV dot. You're just kind of directly calling the global variable name. Uh, no, not even a global constant, so local con constant. Uh, oh, into the function? Inside the function, because there's no other place where it is being used. Gallu is the only function where those constants okay. are being used. Uh, and I didn't speaking even from an, be used. Speaking from an yeah, speaking from an eager execution perspective, it's probably better to not have it in the function because it just takes time defining it. And do you not recast it every time you call the function when you get eager? Probably it's better yeah. to define it outside the function in the namespace. Uh, actually, the one more point which I've covered later is like we want to also avoid that side effects because of having unnecessary global variables. Uh, like that's a, that's I guess that's a great one because speaking speaking eagerly, obviously in the graph compiler it doesn't matter. It's all Kafka's constants yeah. anyway. If we have the constant constant logic, but um, but eagerly, I do think maybe kind of static computation should maybe be taken out of functions. But um, yeah, yeah, it's difficult. Though. Well, let's get let's talk about that when we get. Yes. Yeah. yeah, I mean, this is it, given that it's very specific to Gellio. That's when, like, um, I was discussing with Joe, who, who was working on this, and the, that's the reason we kind <laughs> From of. From a point of generalization, it makes sense. It's, it's just performance. I mean, performance-wise, yeah. it doesn't necessarily make sense. Yeah, because yeah, like I mean, you shouldn't need to keep, yeah. you shouldn't need to keep like constructing a constant every time you call a function if you know what I mean. Makes sense. Makes sense. I mean, we could still cache it or something, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, we could. Yeah, we could use Ivy dot cache. That's true. Yeah. Anyway, yeah. Let's yeah. get to there and get there. Yeah, it's quite. It's getting a bit off track. Let's let's stay focused. <laughs> yeah. I mean, to be honest, I thought it was it would be a shallow dive at the start, but yeah. So basically, yeah, we should yeah. define every yeah. single uh, direct number which you're trying to use. Uh, wherein someone who's reading the code should know exactly what you're trying to do uh, by having that number, rather than just using that number randomly and no one knowing what is happening. Uh, avoid mental mapping. So this point and the next point are kind of two extremes of the same thing, wherein, first of all, you should be able to provide some context uh, of what that variable is when you're looping over it. For example, if you talk about the first, uh, most people know this is kind of the value test function in the tests, wherein we are trying to kind of do the checks for whether these two arrays are equal, not equal in terms of tolerance. Uh, basically, the loop which you're seeing, if you didn't have these two uh, variables and you instead had x, comma, y, that would be uh, mental mapping, because you are imagining what those variables indicate. And if you have a long, long loop, 
someone who is seeing x and y 100 lines down uh, the implementation they might always have to refer up what uh, x and y mean in that loop rather than having uh, indicating this now obviously this also goes along the lines of the whole meaningful and descriptive names thing but what i intended to say is like not just the names but even the temporary variables which you're using they should indicate uh, something about what they are doing you should provide some context for that like you, if, if you just use k equal to zero and do something inside the implementation uh, for someone to understand that that k should have some meaning and you should provide some context about what you're doing there uh, similar case with the module so inside the module like you're seeing like what we are trying to do is you're trying to this kind of the train mode implementation where you're trying to uh, set all the sub modules in a module to train mode uh, you could have just done for key in self dot v and that would have worked but you need to provide context on exactly what is being done so that is why you would provide like you would define it by some name like module obviously this is also a bit subjective similar to the whole uh, similar to the whole uh, discussion regarding uh, simple implementations but because you also don't want to provide too much context which is kind of the next uh, point so i would actually make just one quick point on that last one yeah. i would even say that that could be improved actually i think that the yeah. the, the, the iterable should be module underscore string because what we're doing yeah. is going through a dict we're iterating through the strings and then we're getting yeah. the attribute of self as a string exactly. and then we're getting the module so i would say for module string in self get attribute yeah. self module string and then return module yeah. for example I'll so you can even be more descriptive than this yeah <laughs> for module string in self dot Given I, that Python is so untyped, I think adding types in the variable name sometimes is helpful because otherwise you might think you're actually yeah. iterating over the module instance and probably for something. To be fair, you could define the type hint at that line itself where module equal to you can define a type hint of IV mod module but, or whatever. But, but, even, but even so, I also think maybe in place of dating the variable or recasting the variable name, that's another one, but I think it kind of suggests that the module is it's the same kind of thing, whereas in reality it's totally changed. We're, we're extracting a string to then get the module at the end or something. But yeah, we, I, I, I see the point there, but I guess just kind of, yeah, well, anyway, I guess yeah. we don't need to make, we don't need to like cut, cut, split hairs on these exact things, but the general yeah. sentiment of having descriptive names holds, of course. Yep, yeah, exactly. So obviously the next goal is to, like you provide context, but you do not provide too much context as well, which is not necessary. Like for example, if you're talking about the context manager in the backend, which basically you enter inside the context manager, it sets the backend, you exit it, it unsets the backend. Uh, we know that this is going to be accessed through the IV utils backend namespace. Uh, now, if you rename context manager to backend context manager, that means you're providing unnecessary context because you know that it is going to be accessed through the IV utils backend namespace. So you would define it as context manager only, and you would not name it to backend context manager, just so that no one will be like, just so that you're not making it like it would, you're not drawing unnecessary context. Now, again, in this case as well, whether it should be accessed through this namespace or whether it should be accessed through the IV namespace, that is a different uh, matter altogether. But what I'm saying is if you have already have the context about what that is what that object is regarding you don't need to provide additional context about the exact categorization which has already been defined in the previous uh, layers of abstraction whatever they might be um yeah yeah exactly so you should not be uh doing that either now one point which i've on purpose i've mentioned here because this is again i feel like an exception in terms of what we've done in IV itself uh and uh, whether it's right or not, wrong, I don't know, because I've made that change. So whether it's right or wrong, it's uh, up, to, <laughs> up to discussion. But basically, um, a few months ago, we had nest. Now, as you know, there's nestable functions in IV, wherein you have a container instance method and a container static method for every IV function. And then you have certain functions which are applied to the whole container. So there's functions which are applied to every, every leaf of a container. And there's functions which are applied to the container as a whole. So for example, if you want to get the shared shape of the whole container, of all the arrays in the container, if you know that all the arrays have one shape, you want to get that shared shape. Or uh, uh, if you know the container, like a variables in your module, uh, all of them have a particular device or a particular D type, you want to get the D type for the whole one rather than getting a container of strings uh, as the output. And in such cases, when the, it is shared across all of the container uh, leaves, the way we've done it, we've added the 
c o n t prefix to the function now when you call this it would be iv dot container dot c o n t multi map which does mean that we are providing additional context uh, as opposed to what would be in a regular nestable function but this is something which we just felt that was necessary to form a distinction between whether to have uh, the function name or like whether to not with to avoid the confusion between a nestable function and a function which operates on a container specifically so as a result in all container methods if you see the base.py file you'd see the cont prefix everywhere which might not be necessary again uh, feel free to make suggestions and i guess we need something it could be kind of nested or something otherwise but i guess yeah because as you say the distinction yeah. is um, most of the container methods apply leaf wise and the leaves don't know about each other effectively it just kind of maps yeah. this thing indiscriminately to the leaves and the cont maybe we should because that sounds a lot like a um but yeah the container prefix yep. uh functions um basically yep. um yeah as you say kind of actually take the leaf structure into account and, and yep. leverage that as part of the function um you know it could be nested or it could be kind of tree multi-map or something i don't know but, but yeah, yeah. I, I think maybe kind of making it clear that it's operating on the kind of yeah. container structure itself is, yeah. is quite useful as you said yeah yeah i mean in a way we are kind of trying to leverage upon the fact that so i think the way we are distinguishing this is because like at some obviously on one hand we could potentially say that we are providing unneeded context but uh, if you don't provide this context it might lead to a lot of confusion where you try to uh, have the same name for two different things uh, essentially yeah. one operates on a leaf by leaf basis and second operates on a container by container basis so yeah. basically to have that distinction is very uh, useful so this is one exception where we have uh, done that obviously yeah. for the the, the names uh, the utils backend context manager namespace is like an open uh, question on whether it should be accessible to that namespace only but uh, th this yeah. is what we've done for now and this is just an example to demonstrate that um yeah yeah now uh, avoid short circuiting now this is something which yasser is already working on there's a pr which has been there for a while uh, which uh, we are trying to get merged. Basically, uh, if you see this implementation, the access argument has a default value of none. Now, the only the first thing which we are doing in that function is if access is none, access is minus one. All you could instead do is remove that if statement and set the default value of access itself to be minus one rather than. So this is called short circuiting, which we should try to avoid as well, wherein you apply additional conditions just to force a default value on a particular argument. Whereas the goal of a default argument actually should be like the value it should hold when nothing was passed. So the, the the replacement here would be access would be set to minus one, and that is something which we should do. We should avoid short circuiting. So this is another uh, one of the variables related uh, things which should which we should follow. So yeah. Now we'll get to functions. Obviously the yep yeah, yes sir. Maybe a small follow up to this. So, at first, yeah. when we when, like when we thought about this, I thought we were um, saving some time by not checking for the uh, non value because the the default value is is minus one. But yeah. uh, like it, apparently, we're just moving the condition to the front ends because all of the front ends kind yeah. of support, that, so you have to check it. So, like exactly, essentially, yeah, th that's there's this small issue, but yep, yeah, just want to point this out. So we're doing the minus one check to set it to none to pass it to IV, and then you're doing the none check to set it to minus one while using it in the backend. And that is kind of something which uh, should be ideally avoided. Um, so yeah, functions. I guess all of this with the graph compiler gets avoided anyway, doesn't it? But, um, and but we yeah, still need I still need to copy. Just don't, it's just annoying, but. Yeah, and it would still but be I mean, these, kind of, these default checks obviously yep. get, get all traced away, but. Yep, exactly. Um, but I, I do think we should, but I do think that we shouldn't bend Ivy's API into weird places just to make the code easier. I think Ivy's API should independently yeah. be sensibly implemented, and whatever we need to do in the front ends as a response to that, yeah. like, so be it. We should really kind of keep Ivy's IR as clean as, in, in, as, clean as sensible yeah. and independent as we can. So. Yeah, I mean, I took that example on purpose because I, because access is minus one is an intuitive thing to do anyway. So that's another reason why we are doing that. Anyway. So, uh, Obviously, functions. So for functions, we've just put three uh, different cases. Again, you'll find all of this in the three uh, blocks which I was talking about. Uh, so yep, meaningful names. Again, there's two extremes to this. You do not want to provide too much context, but you want to provide some context on 
uh, what that function does. Uh, the train tasks with for loop, basically, it's in uh, the meta submodule where you need to tra you're training tasks in two different ways. There's one way in which you're doing a for loop, and there's another way in which you're doing using a different construct. So it helps to kind of distinguish with those helpers because there's uh, there's an argument in one of the meta functions wherein you need to either switch between doing this or uh, using the other approach. So that is why uh, this was named in that way. Uh, the quant multi mapping function, you'd find it everywhere in the container implementations. Basically, what it does is it would call uh, that function for all arrays in the leaf um, of that container. Um, then the last one is basically something, again, the testing, where we have two, one, two tests, like test function backend computation and test function ground truth computation. And uh, basically, again, something which helps to distinguish. Uh, it should not go beyond this point. Like I've on purpose picked the la longest permissible uh, names uh, so that we don't go beyond this. But certainly, it helps at times when you have a lot of functions and you want to tell exactly what you're trying to do. I guess it's quite hard to fully appreciate the importance of these without the kind of other functions in the same yep, group. Exactly. Kind of needs to be discriminated against. Like, I mean, because conch multi map and function, you could say, like, oh, why? in function it seems like that's maybe implied but yeah. i guess like i can't remember exactly but there's also a comp multi map that just went differently yeah. and this is like function specific or whatever um did this one as well test function back in computation test function ground truth computation i wonder where the computation might be a little bit of a boast yeah where the computation is needed but it's always very hard without knowing the other functions and what exactly. they do in the same group um, exactly but but yeah i guess looking at these as being like an upper end really yep. you should, you you should not go not beyond use this, more than yeah. you know four or five words yeah five words i think probably is where we should like use as a mental model as an upper limit if you can't discriminate exactly. all of the functions meaningfully in that many words like maybe you need to um as yep. kind of maybe have le less functions or better descriptions in the words yep. you're using or something exactly so this is this is where we should stop like we shouldn't go beyond this but it helps yeah. if you would like to make things easier for someone to understand because particularly yeah. in terms of IV, because where you have a lot of helpers, uh, it helps to know what the, what that function is doing for anyone who wants to use it. Uh, tests as well, there's a lot of helpers, yeah. so, but those are not public. They are, uh, those are not private, they are public. That's the only difference. Um, yeah. 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 So granularity, again, another subjective thing through what level you want to granularize your functionality. I've just taken an example from uh, with backend wherein there's three kinds of imports which you need to capture. Uh, the first kind of import is the regular import x, y, z. Then the second one is an absolute from import, where you do from x, y, z import a, b, c. And the third is the relative from import, where you do from dot x, y, z import a, b, c. The dot means that that folder exists in your whole system. Uh, we could have handled all of this in the same function. But what doing this, uh, what distinguishing between those three types does is that if you'd like to reuse it again and you only want to apply some logic to the from absolute imports and you do not want to apply that logic to the relative ones, if you can easily use this, uh, because this is more granular, you can make use of uh, th this helper without using any functionality in the rest of them. Again, this is limit uh, the maximum limit of how granular you can be possibly, because you do not want to even make it too granular so that all of your functions are large compositions of small helpers which you have. So you also want to make sure that the smallest functions do not have a large comp composition of even smaller functions. Uh, so yeah, basically, that's the point regarding granularity. Avoiding side effects. This is, again, something which goes to the point of having global variables, which we discussed before, uh, wherein you imagine a function which has which manipulates a mode and we've seen that with array mode functions because mostly when you're using one backend function inside another backend function you know that the first backend function was wrapped and you do not need that wrapping in your second backend function because you already know that the second backend function itself was wrapped so until you reach that point in the first backend uh, or the second backend function you know that you've already gone through all the wrapping so you don't need to go through that again so you would disable the array mode before using that function and you enable it again just to avoid going through the wrappings uh, altogether and making the function even slower than what it was before. Uh, secondly, obviously, to also get native types and not having to again and again do the two IV and two native functions inside the backend implementation. So like, imagine you are in that function, uh, and for whatever reason, you enable the mode and you exit the function uh, due to some mistake. Uh, 
and then after you've exited that function you go into another function but you have not unset that mode uh, until you get to the other function and because it was it was a global variable you open yourself to the possibility that the other function which you've reached will assume a different uh, different global state as compared to what it was in the first uh, what it was supposed to receive so this is something which is very likely when it uh, when you deal with global modes because you have a shared variable across different uh, function and that is something which uh, is not ideal obviously what we've done with the uh, global modes which we have is that we've changed them to read only properties so that you cannot easily update them in place you have to kind of uh, we do the checks of whether we are calling it from iv or calling it from outside so that we ensure that all of them are read only properties and we do not make those lead to those inconsistencies uh, it also helps because you do not need to have an explicit getter but what i'm trying to say is uh, we are trying to avoid the uh, risk of having global modes obviously the reason i mentioned the stacks here is this is a point of discussion again whether we want to have it in this way or whether we want to do deal with it in some sort of um, like some way to avoid it from being uh, unnecessarily modified uh, if there's a like whenever we use it in our implementation or someone else uses it so obviously that is why i pointed it out here so this is not like a what you should be doing this is something which falls under the category like if we ever come to discuss stack which uh, yasser might want to uh, but if we ever come to discuss that we might also discuss it in this context uh, so yep let's uh, move forward yep quick question on that what's the, the, the is instance check seems a bit verbose is this something that we was done as so we have unified assertions and stuff? It feels like yeah. What, what does check is instance do exactly? Aside it's from just, doing like assert is instance. That's exactly what it's doing. So inside the assertions, we've kind of added. I mean, we've done some kind of things which we might want to kind of again uh, depends on. This is definitely touching on the same debate of the previous one. Exactly. I, I, I think yeah, it's different. I think I think some of these might be because assert is instance mode ball is it's kind of well it's less than lines than doing it directly from the tree i guess iv dot check instance i guess check is instance is part of the iv um dict anyway yeah anyway so we don't need to do the whole chain to call it i wouldn't yeah. have thought um, the same as the still, yeah, that's, before, on, yeah. that's on the fence yeah. yeah that's kind of on the fence as to whether it needs its own function but um yeah. i guess it's still maybe a bit, but then it's not clear that it's an assertion like if it's an assertion, it should be probably called assert as instance instead. Yeah, um, but then it would be check as instance, I, it sounds yeah. like it's just gonna return true or false. Yeah. Whereas assert is instance. I guess it throws an error, yeah. right? If it's under the insertions name assertion chain phase. Exactly. I mean I the utils is completely unnecessary, as I also mentioned with the backend context manager, but we can probably uh yeah. But the wider point yeah, but there's some 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 yeah. Yeah, I was gonna say it's, it's a separate point the point you're making in this yeah. slide, but just maybe you need to re revisit the assertions a little bit and decide if they're all needed in their form as they are. Maybe Yasser, yes is going through lots of the code and we can weigh yeah. in and, and debate some of these things as well. Um, yeah. And also the stack thing, yeah, that's another interesting discussion point. And the benefit being that if you're kind of writing this whole project and you're using TensorFlow, but then you want to quickly, I don't know, do some NumPy loading in a quick yeah. kind of with ivy.numpy, you can kind of step into this context and step back out of it and you're back in the yeah. context you were before. Well, obviously it's a bit less explicit we've had this debate and we'll continue to have it i'm sure anyway um i'll, uh, I'll let you keep, keep going yeah um so classes i mean anyone who knows this knows that there's like the solid principles while using classes but we'll go through them one by one uh i'll tell you based, based, based on what i understood i'm not a software engineer so uh but based on what i understood i'll tell you what i know um so the first well you're, you're kind of a software engineer <laughs> educational expert but you're definitely i think you've claimed the title to be a pretty decent software engineer by now <laughs> yeah but uh, anyway keep going. <laughs> yeah so um the first is single responsibility so i mean this is kind of along the lines of what uh lucas said as well like a class should do one thing and it should have only one reason to change uh like uh, the state of a class is essentially what drives its behavior. So a class should only have one reason to change. Uh, now, this is something which is, again, I've picked it up from the tests, wherein uh, given that uh, set back, uh, with backend doesn't play well with IV compile. Uh, whenever we are testing, we are, whenever we are doing the compiler tests, we want to use set backend instead of with backend in the tests. 
So for so this is the context of what I'm uh, showing right now. Uh, so this the backend handler basically helps you change the backend based on whatever whether you are using set backend, it would use set backend. If you are using with backend, it would use with backend. Uh, the backend handler mode actually indicates whether you are using set backend or whether you're supposed to be using with backend. Now you could have had the backend handler mode itself in the backend handler class, uh, and you wouldn't need an explicit class for this. But uh, then the class would have two different reasons to change. The first reason would be if you are setting or unsetting the backend, and the second reason would be if you are setting or uh, changing the mode, uh, mode of whatever back with backend or set backend you're using. So the single responsibility principle says that a class should have only one reason to change, which means the only reason for the backend handler mode to change would be when you are switching between with backend and set backend. And the only reason for the backend handler to change would be when you are using when you are changing the backend actually using whatever method is uh, applicable. So uh, there's other examples throughout the code base. I've picked these two, but I, you'll, I'm sure you'll find a lot of them. Um, open close principle. Now this is something which uh, says that classes should be open for extension but closed for modification. So imagine the just look. Don't look at the bottom row. Just look at the top row wherein you have the IV array class. And now you are trying to implement a sparse array in IV. And you want it to be usable for in every IV operation, right? You should, and any IV operation should be able to receive a sparse array and operate on it uh, using whatever conversion is necessary uh, to, to and from dense. So one way to do it would be to include everything regarding sparse array and all the helpers and CSR and all of that in the IV array class itself. Uh, but that would make it much more harder to update and to make changes specifically to sparse array because the IV array class itself is doing its own thing. So the open close principle says that you instead extend the IV array class with the sparse array class, which would have everything which is present in IV array, but the additional features which it needs to have. And the sparse array class, and this makes it much more easier to maintain and update because you don't need to. Uh, make changes to the IV array class to do anything in sparse array. So for example, you're adding a new uh, sparsification logic, whatever it is, and you don't need to deal with the IV array class at all. You can just uh, update the sparse array and that's it. The second example, the triangle which you're seeing, this is regarding tensorization, wherein you have a factorized tensor class. And then there's two ways in which you can do tensorization, if I'm not wrong. Um, it's not tensorization, it's tensor decomposition. Uh, you can do Tucker decomposition or CT decomposition. Now, again, you could have had a factorization mode in the factorized tensor class itself, which would uh, switch between the functional components of whatever is being used for decomposition. But it makes much more sense to instead have Tucker tensor and CP tensor classes explicitly, which will do their own thing so that any other place you use you, any other function you want to implement which applies on both of them, you only need to make sure that you are make, uh, your function is compatible with the factorized tensor class. So as a result of it being applicable to the factorized tensor class, you can use a Tucker tensor or you can use a CP tensor and that would just uh, work. So this is also another kind of example of the uh, open close principle. Now getting to the L, this is the Liskov substitution principle. Basically, what this means is if you're writing any code which makes use of a superclass, using a subclass of that superclass should just be a drop in replacement. In the sense that if you have written some code which should work with an IV module, you that same code should just easily work with a linear layer as well. Because the linear layer is a subclass, you should be able to just drop it in that place and the whole code works. This makes the code much more usable because you have written your code to make it compatible with IV module. And as a result, any derivative or not derivative, any in any class with subclasses, uh, the IV module will also be compatible with whatever code you're writing. And again, this is something which makes things much more easier to write. The other three examples I've just kind of added as kind of nice to know kind of things, wherein our device and D-type classes kind of inherit from SDR. This is not a specific example on list of substitution. I just wanted you to know these classes. Uh, then uh, interface segregation. Uh, this means now an interface is anything where, like it's any class, like in Python, like in other languages, there's different ways in which you classify interfaces. But in a Python, an interface is an abstract class or any class in which there's a few methods 
or at least one method which does not have its own implementation but it is just present there and one of the classes which subclass it implement it so for example with the iv module class you have uh, the create variables method which is which does nothing which just returns an empty dictionary in the iv module implementation but what that intends is that given that this is an abstract method uh, that one is not an abstract method actually because it's returning something but and what an abstract method would do it will do nothing and the the goal of uh, that is like whenever you are implementing your subclass of the iv module you would implement what is the create variables method for that particular module uh, because different layers would have different kinds of structures in the uh, or variable dic dictionaries uh, or custom variables you might want to create so that is what an interface is to start with um, now this is an example which i've come across from the uh, builders repository or the builder repository not builders um, basically the spec uh, is an interface because it has an abstract method for getting the value or something um, and you've got different classes in the builder you've got the trainer class you've got the tuner class and you've got, you've got the network class every class depends on a spec that spec indicates different attributes of that particular class now if you un if you only had one spec interface and it had a number of different methods not all of those methods would be applicable to all of the classes which are being implemented so for example the spec method would have a trainer method a tuner method or a net uh, like a trainer specific method a tuner specific method or a network specific method and the spec would have all of them but and your and your trainer class would have to override all three methods the tuner would have to override all three methods and so on but your trainer only needs the trainer specific methods and that is when whenever you see a conflict like that that is the time when you should uh, segregate your uh, interface into smaller interfaces so that all of those interfaces themselves can be uh, used so that in the trainer you only override the trainer specific method because it only uses the trainer spec it doesn't use the other specs so that is kind of what the interface segregation principle says um, and the last one uh, is dependency inversion so this is again along the lines of what interface segregation is, but uh, it's kind of like they they are complementary to each other in that sense. Uh, because, for example, if one class depends on another class, rather uh, rather than like the class which is dependent on this class, this class would be overfit to that particular class. So if you have another class which is along the same lines, and you know that you will have a similar class to this, and you want this uh, your class to be also working with that class you would have to make some changes to this class to com be compatible with the third with the new newly added class so, so instead what you do is you abstract away the class specific details into whatever category that belongs to and you create an interface for that and then this class would depend on the interface rather than those two classes so that you can add a third class which overrides something in the interface and that automatically becomes compatible with the original class which it uh, so that you don't have to make any changes to the original class on which uh, which is dependent on the interface itself rather than uh, both of those classes. Yeah, I should have had some visuals or something to uh, demonstrate what this. You'll you'll find it. You'll find diagrams. Uh, you can go around to uh, look at it. But basically, yeah, basically what I'm saying is rather than overfitting to one particular class, you abstract away the uh, details and you just have the common stuff between all of those classes. You keep that in an interface so that any other class falling in that category also becomes compatible with the third class without making any changes. Uh, that is the dependency inversion principle. As you can see, the IV module, you can treat, uh, treat it as an interface, wherein in the IV module class, rather than uh, making, uh, like rather than overfitting to a convolution layer, you are, you are fitting it to an IV module so that any of the instances of an IV module would also be compatible with it, which is why I said that it goes along, goes hand in hand with interface segregation because your interface, uh, you should also not uh, kind of have the interface too general so that you are implementing unnecessary methods in the subclasses. So you should segregate that, but or rather than oh, you should also not overfit to a work one particular category. So if you had a specific kind of a trainer inside the trainer spec rather than overfitting to that spe specific kind of trainer, you would make the trade-off and you would depend on the trainer spec, but not on the original spec as well. So basically that is what 
dependency inversion is i don't know how much you got i as i said i'm not a professional software engineer i am just telling you what i've learned um uh, but again i i would disagree with that to some extent but, <laughs> but i know yeah. what you mean <laughs> uh yeah so that was the hard part i think this is the easy part so the pythonic stuff like this these are some of the things which are recommended for people using python itself where you try to use list comprehensions list comprehensions means the single line for loop thing rather than kind of always implementing a for loop and a multi line structure you just try to do it in a single line uh swapping variables again rather than doing the generic way you just do a comma b equal to b comma a that is another thing which is suggested uh slicing is recommended as much as possible uh as well in uh for people again you know but but my point with spo- uh, slicing is that we do not also want to make the code that hard to understand for someone that you have so complex sli- uh, slicing with uh, with so weird indexes that it may become so hard to for someone to understand as well so again i think that is a trade off with slicing but the first two points is when it is highly recommended for someone to do uh with slicing again you sh- it makes sense to uh kind of uh just quickly get a particular sub um uh, sub structure or sub sequence of whatever it is uh it was present originally and yeah we get to the conventions now um so for classes as you know it should be in pascal case wherein the first character of all of the um all of the words should be capital uh, obviously i've come across some instances where it is not the case uh, and those should be fixed but i as a re- i reiterate i didn't want to show any bad examples here uh, with the variable names uh, it should be all in snake case uh, as everything small letters just uh, separated with the uh, underscore uh functions again snake case uh constant should be snake case but all capital so we so with constants again is in snake case but everything in capital um uh, again i like i don't know if that should apply like i think it should should apply in the uh iv constants as well possibly uh i mean one one argument against that is like math.py yeah. isn't uh i think math.py is lower case if i'm not wrong math.e lower case i think you should case. change that actually i know that in numpy numpy it's lower case and in tensorflow i think pf.py has it as lower case but i think actually yeah. we should probably make them more upper case maybe yeah. just to really distant as an so yeah, i'll leave again, this with you yeah and pro- probably we can discuss this later again with modules it's again snake case uh and obviously yeah. you should be consistent between what whether you're using single quotes or double quotes with in our case everything is double quotes uh and arlen bot is doing that uh, as well um and yeah that's it <laughs> sorry for taking nine more minutes but yeah no, well, nice. yeah well first of all first of all yeah big round of applause uh, for that cool well yeah um so yeah i think that was really well covered um obviously if anyone has any questions and people can reach out to vet on you know the formatting channel or general channel or, or whatever um if anyone has any questions who is watching online or anything then obviously as always the discord is a place to go and you can answer any questions um there's there's obviously some where there's still some debates to be had on kind of how how um atomic we make the functions and 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 where we want to kind of remove you know brace create very simple functions for avoiding duplication that's a, a you know about the, the just the debating the boundary of that is still subjective um but i think there were some very good examples of where it's kind of quite close to the boundary but still a good decision um and, and yeah um yeah well thanks a lot thanks again bad um hope everyone has a good rest of the day and see everybody again uh, thanks a lot bye 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 bye